All right, tonight we're continuing our study in the Gospel of John, and uh, our visitors are joining us with a very unique passage because it's one of the most controversial passages in the Gospel, and I'm going to explain why, and I'm going to give you my take on that. And uh, it's okay to disagree. Great people disagree about this passage, and I don't mind if anyone is wrong. It doesn't bother me when they are. I'm just kidding. So, anyway, but we're talking about the passage. It comes to the last verse of chapter 7, verse 53, uh, through chapter 8, verse 11, and we refer to it as the woman uh, caught in adultery. And the reason uh, that we have to deal with some technical issues tonight is that in the majority of Bible versions in English these days, you're going to come across a textual problem. And the textual problem is actually presented right there in your Bible. And here in the NIV, it reads like this. This actually appears before the text. It says, The earliest manuscripts and many other ancient witnesses do not have John 7, 53 through 8, 11. A few manuscripts include these verses wholly or in part, after John 7:36, John 21:25, Luke 21:38, or Luke 24:53. And so when you're reading through your Bible and you encounter this statement, the first question is, well, there's many questions. In fact, I, I count at least four questions to this textual problem. Is it scripture? Does it belong in the canon, the canon being the collected works that we call the Bible? Did John write this? Is it a true story? And, uh, you know, for people that may be new in their faith or maybe have just read past this and not thought about it, or perhaps they read a Bible version that includes these passages without this statement, uh, they may never have thought about it. But what I find is very few people ever ask any questions. I think it's one of those things that we just don't ask, don't tell, we're not going to deal with it. In fact, in many uh, preaching lexicons in denominational churches, this passage is skipped. In other words, you're preaching through the Bible or you're preaching through a lexicon, and they'll just skip this. And that's been a tradition for a long time. But should they? So I want to I want to kind of load the case one way, and then I'm going to come at it another. So bear with me because I'm going to read from a few commentaries tonight. I want you to know how most people see this, and then I'm going to give you my view, okay? So don't react, don't get mad and storm out when I start reading this, all right? So I'm, I, I chose some of the most highly regarded commentaries. The, the commentaries are written by theologians, biblicists, language experts, um, seminary professors, and pastors use them when preparing sermons. So I chose some of those highly regarded commentaries. The first one I want to read, I'm just going to read a little paragraph, and then we'll go on to the next one. The first one comes from the Expositor's Bible Commentary, Volume 9, on John and Acts. It says, although this narrative is included in the sequence of the outline, it can hardly have belonged to the original text of this gospel. It is absent from most of the oldest copies of the gospel that precede the 6th century and from the works of the earliest commentators. To say that it does not belong in the gospel is not identical with rejecting it as unhistorical. Its coherence and spirit show that it was preserved from a very early time, and it accords well with the known character of Jesus. It may be acceptable as historical truth, but based on the information we now have, it was probably not a part of the original text. That was the expositor's Bible commentary. By the way, when we're talking about original text, I want you to understand. When the, when the New Testament was written, and it was written over the course of many years by several different authors, uh, the, the writing that they actually put pen to paper, so to speak, we call those the original autographs. No original autographs exist today uh, because the, the material, the papyrus generally that was written on, some was written on vellum, uh, has long since disintegrated. However, we have manuscripts, copies of copies of copies, that go back to the 4th century. And so when they're saying, uh, even into the 3rd century, when they're saying the oldest manuscripts, they're referencing the copies that we have in existence today. They're, they're in various libraries and, and research centers, uh, and only experts get to handle them and look at them. They've been digitized, obviously, and I'll show you one tonight uh, here in just a little bit. So that's what we're talking about. So they say most manuscripts, they're saying most of the copies that we have. Of course, there weren't copy machines. Everything was copied by hand. So the original autographed, John putting pen to paper, 
doesn't exist. Well, or we've never found it. Okay. But copies that came a few centuries after do exist. So that's what we're talking about. So when they say most manuscripts, or the, when they say the oldest and most reliable manuscripts do not have these verses, that's what they're talking about. Now I go to the Life Application Bible Commentary, a newer commentary on, the, on, the, uh, on John. It says, the earliest manuscripts of John's gospel do not include the story of the adulterous woman. It does not appear in any... Now, I'm going to tell you something. What, some of what I'm about to read is not true, and I'm going to tell you why later and why they've said it. They say, this is coming out of the Life Application Commentary. It does not appear in any Greek manuscript until the 5th century, and no Greek church father comments on the passage prior to the 12th century. It's not true, actually. Even then, the comments state that the accurate manuscripts do not contain this story. Uh, going down a little bit, they, go, they, can, they say the evidence against John having included this particular story in his gospel is conclusive. Okay, and that was the life application commentary. The, uh, the New Testament commentary, highly regarded, second edition. This attractive story is not found in the earliest and most reliable Greek manuscripts. It interrupts the flow of the account of Jesus' interaction with the Jewish people, which is taken up again in 8.12. And more than 15% of its vocabulary is found only here in this gospel. Despite its inauthenticity, Metzger says it has all the earmarks of historical veracity. It is consistent with what we know of the person of Christ from what is reflected in the rest of the gospel as well as in the synoptic gospels. In other words, they say this isn't scripture, but it's a good story and it matches Jesus. So whether they want to cast it out of the Bible, they want to hang on to the story. Even the Bible knowledge commentary which is a brief commentary, but generally reliable. They made the comment, almost all textual scholars agree that these verses were not part of the original manuscript in the Gospel of John. That is true. Almost all scholars agree that it was not. Um, we'll get to that here in just a moment. Now, when we're talking about a manuscript, let me, I should have given off that one. Uh, da, da, da. I lost my manuscript. Okay, well, I'll come to that here in a moment. I may not have the manuscript. I think I will. We'll show, we'll show it to you in a little bit. We're talking about these manuscripts. We're talking about uh, generally fragments. And I'll, I'll deal with it later when, we, when we'll see it on the screen. Okay, that being said, what do you do with that? Because what I just read, you were some of the top scholars. I mean, some of those were my professors that I had. And they've come to this conclusion. I got to tell you, in, in 30 plus years of uh, preaching and teaching and studying God's word, there have been times in my life where I realized that I knew I had learned something that I didn't know before. And even if I had preached on it before, and now I realize, you know what, I was wrong. That's a hard thing to do. When you come and you grow and you study and you learn, it's hard to go uh, to change and say, you know what, I said this, but I was wrong about it. Here's my view now. And holding that view lightly, because we're all sinners, we're all fail, uh, uh, we're all, you know, uh, weak in our understanding. We do the best we can, but we're ne not, never going to get it all the way right. That being said, one of the worst things that can happen is when you get a momentum of group think, where one person makes a conclusion, and because that person is esteemed, Everybody starts quoting that person. And before long, that snowballs. And so now you have experts quoting experts. And when you trace it all the way back, it was one person's decision. I think that's what's happened here. I'll be honest. There is no problem having this in the text. I think it is scripture. I think it is written by John. And I think I can demonstrate it. Can I prove it? I can't prove it. And who am I to stand up against all the experts? Well, I'm not standing alone. What I want to share with you uh, as we go through this uh, comes from Dr. Zane Hodges. Dr. Hodges is a, a well-renowned re well theologian and um, Bible professor. He wrote two articles in uh, 1979. So this is not new information. I'm not throwing out something that's new. But what's amazing is here we are in 2021 and still most, because I read from a couple of new commentaries, they're still selling this line most scholars agree that but in 1979 zane hodges published two articles uh, in bibliotheca sacra one of the most highly regarded theological journals 
and uh, he makes a compelling case. So I'm going to lean on him tonight, and I promise you I'm not going to bore you. It gets cool. It gets really cool once we're going to get into the text. Uh, so, we're, so bear with me. I'm going to read briefly from Hodges out of Bibsack, Volume 136. There can be no question that the story is not found in many of the very oldest documents. And for this reason, as well as other grounds, there exists today a strong scholarly consensus that it formed no part of the original text of John's Gospel. So he acknowledges there's a case to be made there. However, this is a big however, there are some very serious problems with this widely held view. And in fact, an excellent case can be made that the narrative is not only entirely suitable to its context, but also bears the stamp of Johannian, by John, authorship. And the case, and, and I, rather than getting all, all to the detail, I'm not going to break down the technicality because it gets very technical. But Hodges makes a point that what started that original commentary where people said, well, the oldest and best manuscripts don't have it. We're talking about four manuscripts. And they go by weird names. There's P66, the P is for papyrus. Uh, there's uh, P75, there's Aleph, and B. These four manuscripts do not have it, and they date easily to the 4th century, maybe the end of the 3rd century. They are the oldest manuscripts of John to exist. And since they are the oldest and they're very reliable, people say, well, there you go. There's no adulterous woman story. It's not, it's not part of the original. And so then they fast forward and they look at 5th and 6th century, and then they see the story. So the manuscripts that we have in the 5th century and the 6th century, including the Latin Vulgate, uh, tran uh, translated by Jerome, he, he, they include it. So the, the, the guess at one time was looking at all this evidence that somewhere along the way, after the 4th century, an overzealous scribe inserted this story a story that was based on oral tradition and was probably true, but just wasn't in the gospel. He found a place where it fit, and he stuck it in there. And since that theory got was formed, it spread like wild. And when was it formed? <laughs> that theory pops up early, early, like the 6th, 7th century AD. And it steamrolls and goes on and on. In fact, you can look at some of the, what we call the church fathers, Augustine, Origen, these ancient writers who wrote in the third and fourth century. Some of them had already latched onto this idea and left it out of their commentaries. In other words, they didn't say, we reject the story. Just when they were writing their commentaries on the Bible, they did not include this story. And so people look at that evidence and they say, there you go, it's conclusive. And Zane Hodges lays all that out. He acknowledges that. But then he says, is there not another possibility? So imagine this. And by the way, we're talking John's gospel. Remember John also wrote Revelation. What does Revelation say? It says, if anybody adds to this book or takes away from it, may the curses in this book be added to them. May their name be taken out of the book of life. Okay, you don't want to be adding to the Bible or taking away. So it's a very serious thing to consider. But Hodges asks, which is more likely? That it was added? or that it existed and was taken away. And the people say, no, 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 it didn't exist. We had, these are the earliest manuscripts, they don't have it. Well, then Hodges says, well, what if these four have something in common? P66, P75, Aleph, and B. What if those four are all based on a singular source? Well, guess what? All four of those manuscripts are Egyptian. Now, Manuscripts from the ancient world, they come in Latin, they come in Greek, and they come in Syriac, and they come in a lot of different languages from all over the then known world. These four, all Egyptian. So Hodges says, well, what if this passage was pulled out for some reason, and then that got copied and we just happened to have those manuscripts even though the manuscripts prior to that happening 
included this portion of scripture. So when we start looking at the evidence, and you know, I just read you some commentaries that said no church fathers included it. It's not true. It's not true. And it's not like the chief commentator that I was quoting there, Metzger, it's not like he didn't know this, but he left it out of his commentary because it doesn't take much to look and to find. Here's Jerome. I gave you his full name. He's known as Jerome. In the Catholic Church, he's called St. Jerome. This is what he writes. And by the way, let me give you his, um, his date of death here. I want to get this in here. He died, I think, in 430. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Uh, Jerome died in 420. He says, in the gospel, according to John, in many manuscripts, both Greek and Latin, is found the story of the adulterous woman who was accused before the Lord. Now, this is a testimony. This is a positive testimony of the story existing. And he's implying that in some manuscripts, it's not in there. Now, why is it significant that Jerome brings this up and then acknowledges that many manuscripts have it? That tells us that even though the earliest manuscripts we have are these ones from the 4th century, well, Jerome had earlier ones. He had ones from the 3rd century, 2nd century, 1st century. And he traveled widely. And remember, this is the man that will go on to translate the Greek into Latin and give us what's called the Latin Vulgate. Guess what? He included the passage. This is in the Latin Bible, okay, from the fifth century. Why is that significant? If Jerome knew that it was suspect or if he thought it wasn't scripture, he would not have included it. And so when a commentary says, oh, no church, he's considered a church father. When no church fathers, thought of it as scripture, even commented on it. It's just not true. Are there many who didn't? Yes. Origen, Chrysostom, Cyril of Alexandria, uh, Co Cosmos, uh, Nonus. Th these were people that wrote widely and they did not write on it. But all that means is they didn't write on it. It's, it's evidence from an absence of speaking. Here is a positive testimony where Jerome says... It's a story that's included in many manuscripts, and then he chooses to include it in his translation. Moving further, perhaps you've heard of Augustine. Augustine died in 430, 10 years after Jerome. He says to the effect that certain persons of little faith, or rather enemies of the true faith, Fearing, I supposed, lest their wives should be given impunity in sinning, removed from their manuscripts the Lord's act of forgiveness towards the adulteress, as if he who said sin no more had granted permission to sin. That is an earth-shaking statement from Augustine. Now, is that the reason people took it out? Do we know Augustine to be correct on that? No, but it's what he felt. And I tend to take his word writing <laughs> over commentators that came along 15 centuries later. I think Augustine had a better handle on it. So now think about the scenario. If we're, if we're to believe this happened. So one zealous scribe comes along to this story of a woman caught in adultery being forgiven by Jesus. And this man has a, maybe a scandalous wife. And so he's copying the scripture of John. Eh, let's just skip that. Just keep, you know, let me just skip, leave that story out because he doesn't want to encourage sinning. And then his Egyptian copy, his Egyptian manuscript, gets copied a lot. There's another, and again, Augustine, church father. The next one, Ambrose, is not a church father, but he came shortly. Uh, it came actually. He came before these guys. Uh, he he was a bishop. Ambrose. Notice what he said. At the same time, also the gospel which has been covered could produce extraordinary anxiety in the inexperienced, in which you have noticed an adulteress presented to Christ and also dismissed without condemnation. How indeed could Christ err? It is not right that this should come into our mind. 
starts to make sense. It, it, it doesn't, to me, ring true that this story would be added by someone. What do you need to add? We've had incredible uh, forgiveness and compassion from Jesus in many episodes in John. Why do we need to add one more? Oh, well, it was a tr traditional story. No, it makes much more sense for people looking at this thinking it sends the wrong message. What does that tell us about? Whoever this was that may have done this, what does this tell us about them? Um, well, they were a little too concerned about uh, human behavior and, too, and not concerned enough about the grace of Jesus Christ exhibited towards this woman. So, in, in light of quotes like this, you know, you begin to have uh, the possibility. By the way, here it is. I just left it out of order. This is uh, P66. I just wanted you to know what a manuscript looks like. This is actually the top. These are pages, a folio, and this will be the majority of the book of John. There's This passage is not in P66 uh, that we're looking at tonight. Uh, but this is one of the oldest manuscripts that exists. By the way, how many manuscripts are there? Thousands, thousands. We have more historical evidence for the Bible than any other ancient document. Uh, there, there's more evidence uh, uh, for this, the ministry and life of Jesus Christ than there is to say that um, Caesar existed, Julius Caesar. It was way more evidence by a factor of hundreds uh, that Jesus existed. And it's based on manuscripts like this. This is an uncial, which means uh, it's written in all capital letters. These are Greek letters. Written ha and, and we have minuscules, which are written in lowercase. This happens to be an uncial. Uh, but just wanted you to see it, that even though this old document doesn't have it, there is another possible explanation. By the way, if we forget age, and we just say of all the ancient manuscripts, do more have it or don't have this story? Well, to read the commentaries that I just read you, you would think that none of the None of the manuscripts, maybe just a few have it. Actually, the majority of the manuscripts have this story. And when we come to textual criticism, there's two ways of looking at it. One way says the older the manuscript, the more reliable. The other way says the more of a manuscript that we have, the more reliable. Because you copy the good ones. If you make a mistake, you're not going to copy that one. You copy the good ones more and more and more. Which, which is true? Well, actually, they're both true. You want the majority of the oldest. <laughs> yeah. But there's a time where you look at the oldest and you think, well, we don't have many of those. Maybe that's for a reason. They weren't copied for a reason. What happens today when a publisher publishes a book and it's got an error in it? They issue a recall. And they destroy the books with the errors in them. Meanwhile, they publish a new edition and they crank it out. And so you fast forward 10 centuries, you look back and you're like, well, we found these few copies, but they say this. And these thousands of copies over here say this. Which do you trust? Well, these are older. These came out later. For some reason, they tried to recreate history. No, maybe that, that was just the reason it got copied was it was accurate. I think that's the case here. That's my opinion. Can I prove it? I cannot prove it. But that's what I believe. I don't normally stand against um, my mentors, uh, but fortunately I can stand next to Dr. Hodges uh, because I think he got this absolutely right. Um, but the vast majority do include this, and guess where they include it? Right here. After chapter 7, verse 52, comes the very next chapter. Yes, sir? Right out of a little bit of trivia to bolster your case. Yes. Um, when you're looking at these manuscripts, as you said, they're going to copy very much later, um, you fit very much on one of the reasons. The internal quality of those manuscripts is simply considered to be bad. Now, which is very, it's very interesting that those manuscripts are considered primary witnesses of contextual criticism that have been basically since the discovery, right? Um, but um, so the way you can judge the manuscripts internally is by um, looking at spelling errors, yes. grammatical issues, um, things that just don't make 
sense. And well, these manuscripts are simply of poor quality in that regard. Um, the ones that don't have it. The ones that don't have it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. The manuscripts of uh, Telegram, Alexander Mendel in general yeah. are tend to be of poor quality. Yes. I, I really like you. I really like you. You're ahead of me. But yeah, I really like you. You're absolutely right. So then, because, we're at, you know, once we deal with kind of the philosophical, do we trust the manuscript? Or we, you know, because we obviously have a difference here. Philosophically, you know, I'm dealing at a very surface level. This is a, you've obviously read on this. It's a very deep topic. But then you come to the text itself, and you start looking at the words in the text. Yeah, exactly. And, and also, yeah, and... Of course, that immediately leads to the question of who is a scriptural authority. And because those same people that argue that it's not there, that's the, that the same crop that writes dissertations on how many people wrote Isaiah. Yeah. Um, or, or Genesis, or yeah, yeah. In, in, any, 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 any book. book. Yeah. Yeah, they, you know, because they come at the text with doubt already rather than the text. You know, they want to break the text rather than the text break them. Yeah. But uh, great comment, great comment. And you're absolutely right. And the Holy Spirit. Yeah, it, but you look at, you know, that's why I love to look back at the church fathers. And yes, not all of them have it, but that might be, a, they might have been a victim of what had happened here. But we have some very reliable resources yes. there. Um, that's exactly. If a person is famous, anybody wrote his brain. Yeah. And they were politically influential. That I think is something that puts their faith in yeah. question because they have global fame, and oftentimes that comes at a great cost spiritually. It does. I, you know, I'm of the belief that the original autographs, those written by the the men that wrote them, were were flawless uh, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but over history because of things like politics. You know, we have the book of James, not because the man who wrote it was named James, but because there was a king named James. You know, so they've got to retitled, uh, you, you know, this book to, to match a king to, to stroke his ego. So little things like that creep in, but in the originals we have authority. Did you have a question? Yes, I just want to know if this is unique. Is it the only passage of scripture? Yes! Yes. Now there are there are some other problem passages, like especially like say the, what we call the long ending of Mark. But in terms of an entire story being excised or put an asterisk next to it and say we're not sure about this, this is the only one that's looked at like this. In fact, when you look at the commentaries, I didn't read all of what I wanted to read. I don't have time, but. So many of them say, yeah, it doesn't sound like John. And one commentary says, well, 15% of the words used here are only used here. And so why did this vocabulary pop in? Well, we're going to look at that. Let's look at the text now. Because I, I think as we look at the detail of the text, we can ask ourselves, is this John or is it not? Now, we've been studying through this book so far. and We've seen some very John-like things to do. Like he inserts his commentary along the way to explain things. He doesn't just tell what happens. He tells why it happened. Like when he mentions Judas because he was going to betray him. You know, and so he, he throws his commentary. Let's, let's read this story now and consider the interpretation of this story and see then does it fit. The, okay, so several accusations have been made about this passage. They said it disrupts the flow. It doesn't sound like John. You know, it may be historical, but it clearly is conclusively doesn't belong. I beg to differ. So where was the flow last week? Last week, Jesus went to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles. What is the Feast of Tabernacles? Remember, they're celebrating the harvest and they're remembering their time in the wilderness when they lived, in, you know, had, had to live in temporary shelters. So they built these little booths. I showed you a photo of that last week. They built these booths outside their homes and they move into them and that's a time of celebration. That's where chapter 7, verse 52 kind of left off. Look at verse 53. Okay, come down here. Forget the thing on this. My Bible won't include this. Verse 53 down here. Then they all went home. <laughs> Contextually, that's a perfect fit. 
right? He, he kind of interrupts his flow talking about what the scribes and the Pharisees are doing at the end of chapter 53, conspiring against them, or the end of chapter 7. But the point was they were all out of their homes in that sense. John now picks up the, uh, after the seventh day, uh, seven day observance of the Feast of Tabernacles, it makes sense now that they're going to go home. Of course, in particular, the chief priest and the Pharisees who had just piled on Nicodemus at the end of chapter 7, it says, but they, so then they all went home. Okay, the festival is over. Contextually, it fits. Then verse 1, chapter 8, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. Okay, a couple of things. Jesus, remember, he came late into Jerusalem. He came late. He didn't come to the, at the beginning of the festival because they were trying to kill him. And, and it, he knew they'd be looking for him at the beginning of the week. So he comes midweek. He goes straight to the temple courts. He's teaching in the court of the Gentiles. And that's when all that hoopla arrives. But they can't take him. His time has not yet come. So then Jesus then goes... Whenever he's staying in in Jerusalem, he's either going to go to the Mount of Olives or he's going to cross over the Mount of Olives to the other side to Bethany where his friends live, Mary, Martha, Lazarus. But he goes to the Mount of Olives. This was a common place for him. Remember what scripture says, he had nowhere to lay his head. He's just camping near the Garden of Gethsemane. It's a beautiful place. When you, once you've been there, you're like, yeah, if you want to get out of the city and go someplace beautiful, absolutely beautiful. So Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And then notice this, at dawn, This the dawn is literally deep dawn okay so this was what some people would call butt crack early you know this is this is this is the time i get up every morning i wake up i can't help it i try to sleep later but 4 4 30 i'm up there's not even a glimmer of sunlight yet it, it, in only the most obtuse way can you call it dawn here john says i think it's john writing at deep dawn he appeared again in the temple courts. Now, what's happening? The festival is over. People stayed the night. They're going to start going to their homes. They're going to travel back up to Galilee, back down to the Negev. But Jesus, he's got to be about his father's business. So he's up early. He's going back to the temple. So Jesus goes back to the temple. So it's still like the sun hasn't crested yet. You know, you get that kind of purplish and then it's this, you know, the, the reds and the purples, and they start kind of getting this shimmer of blue above you, and it spreads from where the sun is coming up. Well, where is the sun coming up? Let's take a look. Okay, so this is the northern portico. I'll give you one guess as to which side of the Temple Mount that is on. Yes, it's on the northern side, which makes this wall here east, right? This is the Shoshan Gate. So, and guess what's over here to the east of the Temple Mount? Mount of Olives, where Jesus was. Okay, so Jesus is here uh, to the east. So wh where would he have entered? He would have entered through this gate, gone in through here. He could stay in the court of the Gentiles, but I believe because he's going to sit down and teach, well, I'll get to that verse in a moment, that he's going to enter in, he's going to be in this area, which we call the women's courtyard or the courtyard of the women and men were there too the women were allowed there but there was also a place where he could set up to teach okay well uh, let me go back to that verse it says and he sat down to teach them now some people look at that and say well john never says that he never acknowledges that jesus sits to teach so this is very unlike john um Yes and no. It's true in his gospel. He never notices, never mentions Jesus taking the posture to teach. But in this case, it is relevant to the story. Because when you sit, you're taking the posture of a rabbi. So I'm seated right now, so I'm in the posture of a rabbi. That's You would sit to teach. Jesus is going after the festival. He's going to teach. He's going right into the temple. He's planning on teaching. There's still pilgrims there that came down for the festival, and he wants he has more to teach them. So he goes, he sits down, he starts talking. People start gathering. So the fact that this is the only time John mentions that, it's relevant to the story. It's absolutely relevant to the story. 
So there he is. People start gathering around him. So I'm going to put him here dead center right in front of Herod's temple. He's going to be in the courtyard of the women, which contextually is the only place he could have been for what's about to happen. Does that make sense? So uh, verse 3. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery that made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him, but Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. So he was teaching, he was seated, he was teaching. They rudely interrupt by dragging a woman in. And uh, several things to note here. Uh, First of all, we don't know how many are in this group. Five, six, doesn't matter, but it's a group of men. Uh, They are Pharisees. And they're dragging along a woman who they claim, they say, was caught in the act of adultery. Jesus doesn't contest this. Now, John's commentary here in verse 6 is so like John. How can you miss that? We have seen him add these little nuggets that are, you know, it's kind of like, you know, having the hindsight. They were doing this to try to trap him. It's a very John-like thing to do. And how people miss that and say, this doesn't sound like John. This sounds exactly like John. In fact... Very exactly. This phrase, they said, uh, this they said were tempting him. Uh, They were using the question as a trap. When we look at this in the Greek, it is almost word for word the same expression from chapter 6, verse 6. They were doing this to trap him. I mean, there's only a few letters difference. And when people say this doesn't sound like John, I'm like... It only sounds like John because he's the only one in all of Scripture to use this phrase. (laughs) John wrote this. There's no doubt. So now when we take, now let's just consider the context of what are they trying to do. Uh, On the one hand, uh, uh, John is going to bring up later, chapter um, 18, when we're getting towards the crucifixion, that capital punishment uh, doesn't belong to the Jews. Why? Well, because they were occupied. uh, They were occupied by Rome, right? So Rome was the only one that had the power of capital punishment. So on the one hand, this trap is if Jesus calls for her stoning, he's actually usurping the authority of Rome, and they could actually use this as an accusation against him to the Romans claiming here he is, he thinks he's a king, he's trying to usurp Rome's authority, and that gets Jesus in trouble. So on the one hand, they're trying to set him up. On another hand, there's going to be three hands here, by the way, don't ask me why, but there's three hands. Uh, On the second hand, Jesus has a message of grace and forgiveness. Remember what John said in chapter 3, verse 17, he didn't, I didn't come into this world, John, John quoting Jesus, I did not come into this world to condemn it, but to save it. Now they want him to condemn a woman to death. And so that second hand is going to set him off against the crowd. The third hand is, if he says no, let her go and shows compassion, now he's violating the law of Moses. So it's a lose, lose, lose. They think they've got him trapped. So John throws in this commentary. They did this as a trap. The trap isn't immediately obvious, but it's a multi-levered. It's actually clever. It's clever. We see politicians do this all the time. You know, a reporter, if they want to trap them, they'll ask them a no-win question. And what does a politician do? He doesn't answer the question. Well, Jesus does one better. He's going to turn the question on its head. Okay, we'll get there. Uh, now, oh, let me back up. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. Now, these commentaries, these ones that <laughs> unfortunately don't think this passage belongs in there, they, they get so excited about what Jesus was writing. 
Listen, if what Jesus was writing was important, John would have told us. What he is writing is not important, but it is important that he's writing on the ground. And this gets more obvious as we go, but I'm going to kind of steal my own thunder here. What was Think of the times in the Bible where you see the finger of God writing. I can only think of a couple. Ten Commandments, twice. Yeah, because Moses breaks the first set and you got to go back up for a copy. But both times, in fact, that's Exodus 31, 18. When the Lord finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two tablets of the covenant law, the tablets of stone inscribed by the finger of God. And we get a repeat of this in chapter 34 because Moses broke the tablets. He was mad. And then there was a passage in, in uh, Daniel. Remember the warning, many, many, tekel ufarsin, on the writing on the wall with the finger of God, right? So going back, let me just back up. So they've got a woman caught in sin and Jesus writes in the dirt. Just think about that Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were given by God not as a, a means of destroying his people, but as a means of demonstrating his righteousness and saving his people. But they missed that. So we pick up in verse 7. When they kept on... Excuse me. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them... Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Now, without sin is, is um, it's a little ambiguous, actually. Does he mean uh, generally, in other words, sinless? <laughs> or does he mean specifically this sin? Now, remember, Jesus has the advantage of knowing what's in the hearts of men. So he knew these men. Um it doesn't really matter the ambiguity here, the effect. We know the effect. We know the story that no one is going to take up a stone against her. Now, you know, one of the things when I look at this, one of the questions I have is, was anybody there without sin? Yeah, one person. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Okay. But Jesus is also an expert in the law. He knows the law of Moses. And the law of Moses, you know, we when we get to it. I don't know if I put it in here. i put it here in a moment. Yeah, we'll get to it here in a moment. Uh, the law of Moses requires, had certain requirements for someone to be stoned for adultery. So he tells them, let me go back, let any one of you who is without sin be the first ca uh, cast the first stone. Then notice what he does. He Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Now, I think John, knowing his audience, is evoking an image here because it doesn't matter what he wrote. He wrote twice. He wrote the first time and he talked about the sin of the people. God wrote the first time the stone tablets. Moses takes it down the mountain and what does he find? He finds the people making a golden calf engaged in sin. Throws the tablets down, he goes back up the mountain and God writes again. The imagery is unmistakable. The act of writing the finger of God that this finger was not about destroying his people. If it was about destroying it, Moses could have just, you know, hung back and let God strike all the Israelites dead that were making the golden calf. But he didn't. Out of grace, Moses goes back up and God writes in the ground or on the stone again. At this, verse 9, at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. And, and so this, um, you know, whether we say that uh, it was based on their experience, and I think that's the most likely, you know, older people, we have more sin to, to feel guilty for. <laughs> and the younger people tend to be idealistic. But as they see the old people walking around, walking away, and they, they realize that. What's really happening here that they begin to walk away? Well, think about, again, the time of day. It was early when Jesus started teaching. Somewhere as dawn is breaking, 
this crowd comes, they caught this woman, literally, in the night, caught in the act of adultery. And they are accusing him, but Jesus is exercising this tremendous grace and wisdom, and the light is coming up. I think the light from Jesus, if I can be metaphorical, was so damning, they could not stay in his presence. You know, they came in there with a plot to trick him and to trap him. I mean, his righteousness is just oozing out, and they cannot, they're like cockroaches, you know, just scurrying in the night. Do you know, cockroaches don't scurry in Costa Rica. What's up with that? They, you know, it's, they're like, hey, welcome to the neighborhood. Yeah. The only one who doesn't scurry is the woman. You know, she's, she's still standing there. Now, of course, they, uh, I think I threw in the, uh, Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Uh, no one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. There's so much happening here. Um, here is the, the literal lawgiver, the one who made the Ten Commandments that for bad adultery and what he was doing right now for this woman he had done for an entire nation at Sinai his moral requirements are the same they haven't changed God doesn't change it was still a sin and so just as you know, God gave the commandment again, reissued the tablets, tablets 2.0. So he reissues that command for this woman. She was guilty. So what does he say to her? Go. Don't sin again. I think, and this is very specific, I think. Stop your life of adultery. Because this is consistent with the character of God. Forgiveness, but not, um, not condoning the sin. Not condoning the behavior. He forgives. But his standard remains absolutely the same. But here we see him absolutely loving towards, uh, towards her. Uh, the problem with the, the, the law, when we look back in Leviticus and Deuteronomy actually required that the woman and the man caught in adultery be brought together for judgment. So you could say, how does Jesus not then have to fulfill the law by stoning her? Because the law had already been broken. Two wrongs don't make a right. You cannot judge. Where was the man? Did he escape in the night? Was he somebody that they knew? Was he one of the men standing there but unaccused because it's you know, makes Jesus look worse to just condemn a woman to death? You know, what was going on here? We don't know the answers to that, but their response of leaving tells us uh, all that we need to know about them. So now, as she leaves, she's probably going to leave the way she was brought in because she came from that direction. So I go back to our map. So she's going to come out here at the gate, beautiful, from the court of the women, and probably straight out the Shoshan Gate. And what's happening now? The sun is topping that ridge above the Mount of Olives. So she's walking full face. I'm imagining this. This is not scripture, but you can kind of see it. She's been forgiven. Going from darkness into light. And now she's walking and as the sun is coming up, the, the time of day couldn't be perfect. It's a new start for her. That's grace. That's beauty. Now if we go to the next verse... <laughs> this verse is included in all the manuscripts. Verse 12, no controversy. 
But this whole escapade, this dirty little matter, this entrapment is over. Jesus won. So he's going to sit back down and continue his lesson. And Jesus drawing on nature, drawing on what everybody just witnessed because people were still there. Now the accusers left, but the crowd was still there. This is the next verse. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, (laughs) I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You tell me that this story doesn't fit? (laughs) It fits perfectly. It's, It's an incredible statement. And if this was written by someone other than John, he had to be one of the most craftiest, most clever writers in all of human history to book in the story so perfectly and to line it up with such poise. I think, you know, this is John. John wrote this. It belongs in your scripture. Just cross out that little footnote if, if you write in your Bible. Just, just X that out. Doesn't I can't prove any of this, but let me tell you, I read this, I see the most incredible, incredible story. And this is where we are tonight. God never condemn, condones our sin. But likewise, in Christ, we are free from condemnation. In Christ, we've been set free. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Why is that? Because he paid for sin on Calvary's cross. He died the just for the unjust so that we might live, including this woman, including this woman. And so I hope you'll never um, neglect this in your devotional reading and you'll take joy in this beautiful, beautiful story of redemption. The one thing about all those commentators that I disagree with tonight, they all generally agree this is a beautiful story, historical and accurate. Well, good for them. I agree. And it's, and this is this is my Jesus because I know I've been forgiven much. And this is I think one of the most the most beautiful examples. And this is what it means to go from law to grace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you Lord so much for your love. Thank you for teaching us through your word what it means to be forgiven and Lord if I've spoken out a turn on this uh, Lord I forgive me but I, I believe this to be your holy word and I cherish it but most of all I cherish the Lord and Savior of whom it speaks a forgiving God who loves even the vilest offender like me for it's in his name I pray Amen